Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Williamson. I am the Executive Vice President here at Scripps Research. Let me welcome you to the front row lecture. Uh, it seems like we have a record turnout. I'm showing over 1,300 people, uh, are all from around the world. Um, I'm glad some of you like the musical selection today. For those of you who don't know, that was Jethro Tull. Uh, and uh, we have at least one person from Europe, so it's good evening to you. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to, to uh, have you uh, hear a Mark Sundrud's lecture today. And you know, today is it's a very popular topic, chronic inflammation. And I wanted to make a few introductory remarks uh, uh, to kind of clarify the context of what we do here at Scripps Research uh, in, in, in terms of what Mark is gonna talk about. So there's a whole family of Scripps institutions, all uh, emanating from the legacy of Ellen Browning Scripps, who at the early part of the, of the 20th century uh, at, founded a number of really important institutions. Uh, there, there are many others that bear the Scripps name uh, around Southern California and in La Jolla, but there's really three uh, biomedical uh, groups that, that exist here right on, right on the Mesa. Uh, the, the initial founding of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography was uh, the Scripps Institution for Biological Research. The initial founding of what's now Scripps Health was the Scripps Memorial Hospital. And uh, Scripps Research is the, the antecedent of the Scripps Metabolic Clinic. And uh, we recently rebranded and renamed ourselves as Scripps Research. Some of you might know us as the Scripps Research Institute. And needless to say, there can be a certain amount of confusion amongst all of these institutions. Uh, I have people ask me all the time, can, I, can you get me a ticket on one of those marine biology tour boats? Um, sorry, can't help with that. Uh, some people ask me for a uh, you know, prescription or a medical referral. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not an MD, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a PhD scientist at Scripps Research. So uh, I just thought I'd go through these uh, relationships. We all have a common uh, genesis, but we really are distinct arms of the Scripps legacy at this point. And, and so the front row lecture is really our outreach to the community uh, to explain what goes on in basic research here at Scripps Research. So the questions we, we try to answer in these lectures is where do new medicines come from? And they all are initiated in the laboratories of biomedical researchers. So uh, there's two drugs that I've listed here, Vindamax and Zaposia. These are drugs that were discovered at Scripps Research, but they, were, they just came to market and they were discovered over 20 years ago. And, and so what we're gonna hear today is uh, from Mark is where is the, the next medicine coming from? So this is a ground floor introduction into the process by which you take laboratory research and, and uh, discover something that will eventually become a new medicine. So I, I have good news and I, ha I have bad news. The good news is in, you're in for a terrific talk. Now, the bad news is many of you might be interested in uh, particular conditions that you might have. In fact, inflammation is really one of the most devilish uh, class of diseases that we all confront at some time in our lives. Uh, so, but the bad news is we can't give you any biomedical uh, advice. So uh, I, I I want to answer all the questions that you have, but we can't be uh, in, uh, in. We can't engage in a discussion about individuals' uh, medical conditions. We're, Mark and I are not MDs, and so we just want to uh, kind of keep you up to breast on what's going on. So I am going to introduce Mark as our speaker. Uh, Mark is uh, an associate professor in the immunology department and he is beaming to us from the Scripps Florida campus in Jupiter, Florida. Mark got his PhD at Vanderbilt and then did a postdoctoral work at Harvard. Uh, he did three years in the pharmaceutical industry before joining us uh, at Scripps uh, on the Florida campus in 2013. Uh, he's a T cell biologist. Uh, he's interested in studying how the immune system uh, it, you know, is involved in both keeping us healthy but in also involved in overreacting and causing some disease states, which is the, the process of inflammation. Uh, he's got some really promising findings 
uh, in inflammatory bowel disease. And I, I'm going to stop there and let him uh, uh, take it away. Thanks, Jamie. I really appreciate that. Um, the first thing that I actually want to do um, is piggyback on a couple of comments that, that Jamie made. First off, um, although you know we are certainly not we are certainly not physicians, I like to uh, uh, endearingly refer to myself and other immunologists often as, as uh, mouse doctors. Uh, we do a lot of work in, in animal models, and I'll talk about how we move a little bit back and forth between animal models of chronic inflammation uh, and analysis of, of human patient samples. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to point out, um, let me make sure, that there we go. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do is to put a little bit more uh, maybe meat on the bones of, of the other point that Jamie made, which was simply to say, right, that all of us who are lucky enough to, to be able to do biomedical and scientific research for a career really do this with two motivations in mind, right? So the, the first is to generate new knowledge or increase new knowledge. Uh, and obviously all of our goals is to apply that knowledge uh, to the betterment of, of patients and people. It's really to help people. Now, I think, you know, try as we might, I, I think for the vast majority of uh, basic research scientists, um, you know, the, the work that we do and the new knowledge that we generate uh, never maybe ra uh, rises to the level of, of actually translating into a new medicine, but we do take solace, right, in the fact that any future medicines that are generated come, right, on the shoulders of, of what we have helped to build up in terms of knowledge, just like what I'm showing you here is, is the layers of sediment and rock, right, that builds up over time, and you reach certain inflection points as you generate more and more knowledge that really transform the way that we understand and, and treat disease. Right. And so I, I use one little girl as an example as shown over here on the right. So this is a little girl uh, that was born with a, a congenital uh, and inflammatory liver disease called biliary atresia, which 50 years ago probably would have been a death sentence. Uh, but uh, thanks to, again, you know, years and decades and, and, and even centuries of, of research into these liver diseases, have allowed this little girl right to grow up to a very happy and healthy 11 year old girl who happens to be my daughter and she's now happy and, and healthy enough that she can run around and uh, do all the the typical things that an 11 year old does like getting all the cuts and bumps and bruises and as she likes to remind me this uh this lob this lobule on her head was actually uh because she fell because i was chasing her but i think that that's a really great example of, of the impact that we as, as scientists can have. Now, of course, the topic of today's lecture, which is really about you know, how we think about and how we treat chronic inflammatory diseases, admittedly, I would say that we, uh, we still have a ways to go, right? Uh, we're still sort of at these early stages of building up these layers of knowledge and sediment to hopefully uh, very soon, you know, continue to, to improve the, the understanding and the treatment of, of the disorders that some of you today may actually be dealing with. Um, so I wanted to start there. Uh, and of course, as, as Jamie mentioned, uh, the mission of, of my lab has been for a long time now to really understand the immunobiology, right, to so the basic biology of the immune system during health and also chronic inflammatory diseases. That's the increased knowledge part. Um, but we do that with a very laser focus on trying to apply that knowledge to actually develop safer and more effective therapies for chronic inflammatory diseases, of which there are very many, and I'll talk about a few today. Um, so, but, I, but I, I wanna start today, right? Because I think it's important if we're gonna talk about uh, you know, how we understand and treat inflammation in different settings, we have to, in one way, I feel like inflammation has become a, a very uh, sometimes misused buzzword in a way. And so I think it's really important to carefully define what inflammation is and to demystify it. Okay, so I mean, inflammation, uh, the, the understanding of, of inflammation as a biological process actually goes all the way back to, to ancient Egypt, uh, believe it or not, and has been uh, and inflammation derives from a Latin word that literally means uh, to set on fire, okay? 
And uh, in the first century AD, this Roman, uh, this Roman physician Celsus uh, wrote in a very famous medical encyclopedia, and he defined what he referred to as the tetrad of inflammation, which we now have extended beyond a tetrad, and now we call it, generally speaking, the five cardinal signs of inflammation. These include heat, redness, swelling, pain, and the new one is, is loss of function, right? Uh, and so, of course, we're used to seeing images of what an inflamed tissue looks like. Of course, for the most part, we tend to look at this. Uh, we tend to look at topical inflammation of the skin because we can visually see it, right? So you see the redness there, the swelling, uh, all of this, right? But it's important to keep in mind, obviously, uh, that inflammation can affect literally any organ or tissue in the body, right? Uh, but they all have, at, at some level, uh, the process of inflammation uh, proceeds uh, in a very conserved manner. So there's damage or infection uh, to a tissue. Uh, that damage or infection gets recognized uh, by cells of the immune system. They start secreting, they become activated, they secrete all sorts of soluble mediators. And one of the first things that, one of the first sets of inflammatory mediators that gets produced are things that uh, dilate blood vessels and cause increased blood flow to the damaged a tissue, and that really underlines this tetrad of inflammation. Uh, then, of course, the idea is, is that if you increase blood flow, all of your immune cells, for the most part, are circulating in your blood. And so that increases the ability of more uh, new recruits from the immune system to go to the damaged or inflamed tissue uh, and try to uh, try to discard uh, the, the insult, whether it's a a virus or a bacteria, so that hopefully the tissue can uh, repair its wounds, of which uh, inflammation also plays a very important role in, in wound healing, uh, and return the tissue to what we call homeostasis, right? Um, okay, but of course, the reason why we're here and why I think many of you uh, uh, signed up for today's lecture is because inflammation has gotten a really bad reputation um, over the last you know, 30, 40 years, right? And so Time Magazine wrote a story in 2004 about the links of inflammation to, to many, if not most major human diseases. This, is, this includes uh, you know, inflammation of the vasculature that can lead to, to heart attacks and to strokes. Uh, also, there's inflammation uh, uh, that's involved in, uh, in most cancer uh, progression, uh, and this can be many types. I'm showing you here uh, some of the ideas that people have around how inflammation contributes to the development and growth of lung tumors, but also colon cancer. Uh, and also inflammation, uh, probably more recently, has become recognized as a very important point in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. But I think it's also, that does a disservice a little bit, right, to inflammation on one hand, because inflammation uh, is also, of course, good, right? Actually, it's essential. Uh, for the first point that I wanna make about that is that uh, none of us would be here, humans would not have evolved as a species had it not been for the positive selection of genes involved in uh, inflammation, right? And interestingly, I think that this probably stands to reason. Of course, human evolution has sort of undergone coevolution with microbes throughout the millennia and throughout the centuries. But there have been uh, recent studies that have very nicely quantified, in fact, uh, and determined that the genes that encode for proteins that, uh, that propagate responses to bacterial and viral infections uh, are overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly display what's called positive selection. So that means that when you randomly generate a mutant version of a gene that encodes for an inflammatory mediator, that tends to be selected because it provides, uh, it provides a competitive advantage over, uh, over the uh, original variant of that gene uh, throughout evolution, and that can actually be quantified. Uh, and, so, and, and so I think that that's not surprising, but to actually quantify that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the selection of genes uh, that are involved in regulating many other biological processes not involved in promoting inflammation and promoting responses to microbial infections, I think has been a really fascinating uh, new set of insights. 
then of course the other thing is that you know inflammation is the basis of, of vaccine development and vaccines and hopefully inflammation is going to be the reason uh, why we are all able, hopefully, to move past this horrible pandemic that we've had uh, and get back to some semblance of, of normal life. And then finally, uh, over you know more recent advances, really over the last 20 to 30 years, have demonstrated that immune cells and the inflammatory process is not only really effective at preventing infections by, uh, by viruses and bacteria, uh, but the immune system and the inflammatory process can also recognize these mutations that give rise to tumor cells and to cancer as foreign. And that can lead to an immune attack and an inflammatory response against the cancer. Uh, and that can lead to, to very uh, durable uh, clinical responses. And in fact, two of the folks here shown on the right, Tasuko Hanjo and James Allison, who, by the way, was, uh, was a, a postdoctoral fellow back in the 1970s at Scripps Research, uh, won the 2018 Nobel Prize uh, in Physiology and Medicine for their discovery that clinically palpable cancer cells have actually evolved mechanisms to avoid an inflammatory response by the immune system. And they figured out what those mechanisms were and that you could devise new therapies to block those mechanisms and to essentially unleash the, uh, the patient's own immune system uh, to kill their cancers. And just to show you what that has meant in terms of real world survival, uh, this, is showing, this plot is, is showing the overall survival of essentially terminal metastatic cancer patients whose tumors have metastasized to their brain, right? So these are terminal cancers uh, and in the blue line, these, these patients are either given standard chemotherapy or in the red line, they're given chemotherapy plus one of these immunotherapies to activate the immune system against their malignant and metastatic cancer. And you can see the survival curves dramatically shift right away. There's about uh, an overall improvement of about nine to 10 months in terms of median survival rate. But more importantly, you can see that the red line, there are several, there are a number of people, roughly 10 to 20%, of these terminal cancer patients who receive immunotherapy and go on to actually live long lives, right? So this is really transformative. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you might guess that based on the fact that, uh, that these two great scientists won the Nobel Prize uh, based on these discoveries, okay? So my point in all of that is simply to say that don't just get, uh, don't be frustrated, don't get angry about inflammation as this persistent pest Right, that needs to be tamped down because in fact, on many levels, it's, it's also incredibly beneficial and incredibly important. So what we really need to do is try to understand why that is. Why is inflammation sometimes good, sometimes bad, right? And where we stand right now, if you think back to our layers of rock and our layers of sediment, we're still sort of at this point where we haven't, uh, at least from a medical perspective yet, we really haven't been able to distinguish and target for medicinal purposes, right? Good versus bad inflammation. We can target inflammation. We're getting good at that. There are a number of new biological therapies. These tend to be antibodies uh, that bind and inhibit the function of pro-inflammatory mediators. Many of them are called, uh, are, are called antibodies against cytokines. Uh, and one is shown here, this thing called Remicade. Uh, so this is one of the most widely prescribed medicines in the world, and it has been for a number of years. So it blocks a very important pro-inflammatory cytokine called TNF or tumor necrosis alpha, which is really a common, uh, it's really a common theme in, in all inflammatory conditions, okay? So when you activate an inflammatory process, the cells start making uh, TNF. And if you inhibit that, you can, you can dampen down the inflammatory response. So accordingly, uh, most of these chronic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases that are driven by inflammatory processes can be treated reasonably effectively with things like Remicade and other biological agents that do similar things. Uh, the problem with this is, again, because we have yet to really understand the mechanisms that distinguish good inflammation from bad inflammation, is that if you just systemically suppress inflammation, as I just told you, right, that, was, that is going to lead to recurrent or persistent infections and even the development of cancers, right? And that really happens in patients. And so oftentimes patients with these horrible debilitating chronic diseases 
are sitting there left with this choice of, do I deal with the symptoms of my disease or do I treat it aggressively and take these very, these very serious risks of adverse events? Okay, so the, the simple question then is how do we distinguish, right, between good inflammation and bad inflammation? What are the mechanisms? What are the processes that, that underlie that switch between a good inflammatory response and a pathogenic or a disease-causing uh, inflammatory response, right? So I'm going to tell you two. Um, I'm going to tell you two ways in which uh, the immune system can can drive a beneficial inflammatory response uh, or a bad inflammatory response. This is not certainly not a comprehensive list, but these are two of the points that I want uh, that I at least think are important to communicate uh, to those of you who maybe think about inflammation quite a bit. So the first, of course, is that it depends on what stimulus the inflammatory response is directed against, right? So good inflammatory responses are those, as throughout evolution, right, are designed to target uh, infections by microbes, right? So these can be fungal pathogens, these can be bacteria, these can be viruses like COVID-19, right? All of the different microbes can elicit a very potent immune-mediated inflammatory response. On the flip side, right, there are literally millions of adults and children uh, uh, in the United States and across the world where those inflammatory responses are actually misdirected, right? So meaning that the basic mechanisms of immune system development that allow your immune system to tell, to distinguish between your own body and a bacteria or a virus essentially break down, okay? And what that ends up leading to are, are these so-called autoimmune diseases in which your own body's tissues get attacked by immune-mediated uh, inflammatory responses. There are literally oh, now over 100 recognized autoimmune disorders. Uh, I'm showing you two examples here that are very common uh, and probably most of you have heard about. So one is called multiple sclerosis. Right, so this is just a CT image of a brain. Uh, and you can see these little white lesions here. These are actually inflammatory lesions and they're caused by the immune system recognizing little bits of, of these myelin sheaths that normally coat the axon, the, the length of your axons in your brain and your spinal cord to help communicate uh, between the, the, uh, the neurons. Okay, and so the loss of that when you get inflammatory damage to these myelin sheaths, then that essentially slows down, uh, that slows down how nerves can talk to each other and the clinical result is a loss of sensory and motor nerve function, right? A second very common autoimmune disease is, is so-called type one or juvenile diabetes, right? So this is very, very different from, uh, uh, from type two diabetes mellitus uh, that is associated with obesity and, and, uh, and so on. So in type one diabetes, these are our kids and, and kids can be diagnosed with type one diabetes you know, in infancy. And again, the cause is immune mediated inflammatory damage that essentially kills the insulin producing beta cells in your pancreas. And so in these kids, uh, they, are, they become completely dependent on insulin in order to, to survive and thrive. Okay, so those are two very common examples of autoimmune disorders. And so again, it's that, that is a pretty clear distinction where you need the inflammatory response to be appropriately directed against pathogens and not your own body in order to be a beneficial inflammatory response, right? But probably another part of this that not everybody thinks about is that not all inflammatory processes are the same. And this becomes really important when we think about, you know, whether or not inflammation, for example, is good or bad uh, in cancer. Or for example, this also helps explain to some extent, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that these different types of, of inflammatory and immune responses may uh, go part of the way at least to explain why some people get very, very ill uh, following COVID infection and other people clear the virus almost asymptomatically. Right, And so there are basically three major types of immune-mediated inflammatory responses, and they're really so-called type 1, type 2, and type 3. So type 1 responses are really geared towards killing intracellular parasites or, or pathogens, so 
These include viruses, these include obligate intracellular bacteria like mycoplasma. Uh, these, uh, and the same uh, type one response is what you want to also kill malignant cells, okay? Uh, type two responses are really geared towards dealing with large multicellular parasites like parasitic worms. And then type three responses, we believe are sort of the most recently discovered, but we believe that this is largely to deal with extracellular bacteria, for example, at mucosal surfaces like the skin, the lung, the gut, and also extracellular fungal infections. So you'll notice also that part of the reason why these uh, different uh, why these different inflammatory responses have different effects, right, is because they essentially recruit and activate different sets of immune cells. And so the names of these are not particularly important, but you can see that they're all different, right? And so that really underlies these distinct types of inflammatory responses. And so again, what I was saying is that, uh, so in the case of, for example, a viral infection like COVID, uh, or in the case of, of an anti-tumor response, you really want to activate and sustain a durable type one inflammatory response to take care of those insults. But I think, uh, but by contrast, what's been shown is that if you, if you accidentally activate uh, a type three inflammatory response, that can be generally uh, uh, pathogenic, right? That can in, in, inhibit the ability of your body to clear the tumors uh, and also to clear uh, uh, to clear um, viruses like COVID. And it can also, because type three responses also uh, tend to promote um, growth factors that sustain and help epithelial cells uh, proliferate, that can actually promote uh, the proliferation of, of malignant epithelial cells, right, or carcinomas. Okay, so that's important to understand too, right? Is that not all of these inflammatory responses are the same and the balance of these different types can oftentimes underlie uh, what is a good inflammatory response versus a, a bad uh, inflammatory response. So the obvious question then is, well, what, what is responsible for directing these different types of inflammatory responses and also, right, for distinguishing your own body from, from pathogens like viruses and bacteria? So, uh, and what I would argue is that the overwhelming evidence suggests that this particular subset of what are called T cells, this uh, very important subset of adaptive immune cells uh, of CD4 positive T cells, these guys are really the generals of, of your immune system. Uh, they play very important roles in distinguishing self from non-self. So they play very important roles in protecting against autoimmune inflammation. Uh, and they also become activated in a way that tells the, the rest of the immune system how to behave. So they really are the ones that are directing the type of inflammatory response uh, that, that is to occur, right? And so the way that this works is essentially that these T cells circulate throughout your blood and lymphatic system. And when they meet up with a ver another very important uh, uh, cell type of the innate immune system called the dendritic cell, so these dendritic cells sit out in your tissues and they essentially sample the environment by eating, uh, by eating stuff, right? And when they come into contact and they engulf a bacteria or a virus, they essentially leave the, whatever tissue they've been resident in, whether it's the skin or the lung or the gut, and they hightail it back to the lymphatic system where they meet up with these T cells and they, and they show the T cells what they found, right? Uh, once that happens, the T cells become what we call activated and they start secreting cytokines, which then instructs the rest of the immune system uh, on how to conduct an appropriate uh, inflammatory response that is tailored to the type of pathogen that they recognize uh, in the context of, of presentation by these, these dendritic cells. So in this way, you can sort of think of this, this moment in which a dendritic cell activates a CD4 T cell as sort of the, the immunological equivalent of the Big Bang, right? From which all things that follow that event are uh, ensue, right? So obviously what my point in all of this is to say that these CD4 positive T cells play enormously important roles in dictating the type of, the type and the outcome of inflammatory responses. And so of course we have been, as my lab, we have been uh, extremely uh, interested now for quite some time in understanding how T cells work in healthy individuals, 
and what goes wrong with T cell responses in patients that have these chronic inflammatory disorders, okay? So one disease that is, and, and we've looked at this, I should say, in the context of multiple diseases over the course of my, my years of training, uh, I've looked at uh, T cell uh, biology and T cell responses in the context of psoriasis. So this chronic skin inflammatory disease, rheumatoid arthritis, which is inflammation of the joints, uh, and also multiple sclerosis, as I showed you, right? But one particularly fascinating set of immune-mediated chronic inflammatory diseases is this set of conditions called inflammatory bowel diseases, or IBD. Now, there are, multi there are actually two main types of inflammatory bowel disease. One shown here is called uh, Crohn's disease, and the other is called ulcerative colitis. But uh, at least as it stands right now, both, uh, you know, neither current biological paradigms uh, nor current medical practices really distinguish between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Although, as I'll show you in a minute, I think that that's a, a big mistake. And I'm hoping that, uh, that our work goes a long way to, to try to really mechanistically distinguish between uh, the underlying features of Crohn's disease and, and ulcerative colitis and how we might be able to uh, leverage that information to be able to come up with safer, more targeted, more effective treatments for the two. Okay, so again, both uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are these forms of inflammatory bowel disease. They both affect uh, the intestinal tract, right? So if you think about your intestine, right, it's just a big tube. Uh, and you can see that inflammation occurs uh, in the lining, in the inner lining of, of the tube of the intestine, right? So uh, on the inside, this is where all the food and the bacteria are. And then you have this single layer of, of epithelial cells that essentially provide a barrier uh, between your body and, uh, and, the, and the lumen of the intestine and all the stuff that's in there, including all the bacteria, right? And so what you can first appreciate is that the inflammation that you see in individuals with Crohn's disease looks different than the inflammation that you see uh, in patients with ulcerative colitis. So that would suggest already that there are some differences. But again, right now we think about these things broadly as maybe two different stars within the same constellation, okay? Uh, so both of these are widely considered to be regulated by both genetic and environmental risk factors. Uh, in terms of the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease, it's actually uh, completely fascinating. As of right now, we have identified about 200 of the nearly 30,000 genes in the human genome. We've identified that at least 200 of those genes play some role in conferring risk or susceptibility uh, to the people that ultimately develop inflammatory bowel disease. And what's even more interesting is that those 200 genes are estimated to account for only about 10% of the total genetic diversity or variability between patients with IBD and healthy individuals. Uh, in terms of the environment, we know that diet plays a major factor. This is in large part due to epidemiologic studies that demonstrate that inflammatory bowel diseases have essentially emerged recently within the last 100 years coinciding with the industrial revolution. And in addition, right now, uh, most uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, most inflammatory bowel diseases are actually found in westernized or developed uh, countries. So this is really a, a disease of, of westernized and developed uh, countries. So both these genetic and environmental risk factors then converge at the level of regulating this very intricate balance between the trillions of bacteria in all of our gut and our, uh, and our immune system uh, underlying the, these intestinal tissues, right? Uh, now, the, so currently right now, I would say that, uh, that the, the, the general idea is that, uh, is that the gut, this, this balance between gut bacteria and the host immune system really explains most of the biology of both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in large part, it's, uh, but at the same time, it's a little bit confusing because uh, bacteria, of course, are present throughout the intestinal tract and really just don't explain a lot of these, the discrepant biology that's been observed, certainly in the clinic uh, between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So we were, we've been really thinking about this, uh, the distinctions between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis for a while. Uh, and in particular, I think one of the important points that I want to mention is that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis really predominantly affect two completely different portions of the intestinal tract. So Crohn's disease, is, uh, Crohn's disease can occur 
or it can affect really any portion of the, the upper or lower gastrointestinal tract, but two thirds to three quarters of patients with Crohn's disease have inflammation of the small intestine. Okay, so it overwhelmingly affects the small intestine, whereas ulcerative colitis, as the name insinuates, inflammation is actually completely restricted to the colon. Okay, so from in terms of how we think about the immunology right now of, of Crohn's disease and, and ulcerative colitis, we really don't draw a distinction between the small and large intestines. But of course, uh, going back to our basic anatomy and physiology, we appreciate that in fact, the small intestine and the colon are, are actually two completely structurally and functionally different organs, right? So the small intestine is really designed and dedicated uh, to uh, to digest food and to absorb nutrients, whereas, of course, the colon, uh, the colon's job is to then desiccate and eliminate uh, solid waste. So this specialized function of the small intestine to, to digest food and to absorb nutrients really comes by virtue of its very close connection with other organs in the gastrointestinal tract, namely the liver and the pancreas. So whenever you eat a meal, uh, that stimulates hormones that secrete the, the production and the deposition of enzymes and other metabolites from the pancreas and the liver to help break down and digest food, uh, especially uh, insoluble fats and fat-soluble vitamins, okay? So one very important class of, of liver-derived metabolites that aid in the digestion and, and absorption of fats and fat-soluble vitamins are these things called bile acids. And so I, I understand that for the purposes of this talk, you don't need to be able to see the structure, but you can, you can see these sort of yellow ring straight shaped structures uh, that indicate that it's a steroid like molecule that's made by the functional cells in the liver called hepatocytes from uh, cholesterol. Okay, you can also maybe see these other little circles where these bile acids can be modified uh, to give rise to a whole uh, library of different types of bile acids that have both similar and also non-redundant functions to some extent. Um, and so these bile acids, again, get deposited postprandially after you eat a meal into the small intestine. Uh, they go in and they essentially help emulsify or they mix up and solubilize fats and fat-soluble vitamins and allow your intestine to absorb those as nutrients. Now, the interesting thing is that when these bile acids finish their job and they transit the length of the small intestine, when they get down to this to this very distal part of uh, the small intestine called the ileum, which again is where the vast majority of uh, inflammation and Crohn's disease is seen, uh, those bile acids actually get grabbed up by the epithelial cells. They get reabsorbed into the underlying mucosal tissue where all of the immune cells live. And then they sort of passively re-enter capillaries that take those bile acids back to the liver. So that whole process is called is something called enterohepatic circulation. It happens about six to eight times in a typical adult, depending on how much uh, and what type of food you eat. Uh, but we really haven't explored the role of, of bile acids uh, in small bowel uh, Crohn's disease. And this was one of the things that we wanted to do. And so starting several years ago now, uh, we, we began a study uh, and we identified that in fact, activated CD4 T cells or T helper cells, when they migrate into this portion of the small intestine, the ileum where bile acids get reabsorbed. And so those cells would, would come into contact and get exposed to the, all of these bile acids, they completely change their behavior. And one of the first things that they do is they upregulate, they dramatically upregulate the expression of this particular protein it's called MDR1 or multi-drug resistance one, okay? And that process through which these T cells upregulate this MDR1 protein turns out to be incredibly important to safeguard uh, small bowel immune homeostasis, right? So it prevents uh, bile acid induced inflammation. Now we're still trying to understand exactly what this protein is doing, but it's, it's, it's very much interesting to know that what this protein does is it sits on the on the surface of the cell membrane. Uh, and it essentially spits out any cytotoxic drugs that, drugs or agents or chemicals uh, that are coming uh, from the outside in, right? And so cancer cells, of course, are unfortunately very smart and they've figured out that they can uh, usurp the function of this transporter to spit out cytotoxic drugs and to help create uh, chemo resistance. 
In this case, we think similarly what this what this MDR1 transporter is doing is actually uh, is actually removing or limiting the intracellular accumulation of bile acids uh, uh, from cells that are in the small intestine and exposed to them in the ileum. So again, the other point that I want to emphasize is that all of this biology, all of this interaction between bile acids and T cells in this portion of the small intestine or the ileum, uh, all of that is completely specific to the ileum. These cells, which circulating T cells will come into contact with high concentrations of these cytotoxic like bile acids. So functionally, uh, functionally, it's important to know that if the way that we did this uh, work was uh, using animal models, we showed that if you inactivate the gene that encodes for this MDR1 transporter in T cells, uh, we showed that that results in uh, Crohn's disease like small bowel inflammation in mice. And we showed that you could prevent and even therapeutically reverse that inflammation if you use a very safe and inexpensive class of FDA approved uh, medicines called bile acid sequestrants, which essentially can be administered orally to humans or to mice. They go into the small intestine and they act like a sponge to soak up bile acids and to, and to prevent their reabsorption into the ileum. Okay. So this, this discovery was really, uh, was sort of a, a tip of the iceberg moment for us because we, we thought to ourselves, well, if, if T cells are dedicating you know, a protein like this MDR1 transporter to handle and to respond to stress induced by bile acids that they, when the, that they encounter in the ileum, there must be other uh, genes and proteins that T cells use to do the same thing. And that would sort of suggest a, a, a novel biological pathway that we sort of uh, consider or refer to as a bile acid response pathway in T cells. And so together with a collaborator here, Matthew Pipkin, uh, we proposed and, and performed a really, uh, a really exciting uh, genetic screen to identify other factors uh, that T cells may also leverage to protect themselves from bile acid stress and toxicity and inflammation in the ileum. And one of those proteins that we're about to report next week uh, in a paper that's coming out uh, is, a, is a protein called the transcription factor that regulates gene expression. Uh, this protein is called CAR, you see it here uh, circled, that stands for the constitutive androstain receptor. And CAR currently is only known to be expressed and functional in the liver, where its functions are also to protect the liver from bile acid toxicity. And so what, what our results are, are showing is that uh, this CAR protein uh, actually directly senses bile acids and mounts this whole protective response that uh, prevents small bowel uh, inflammation uh, in mice. I would also tell you that, that through the course of these studies, we've asked simple questions in humans, like do human T cells in the small intestine also appear to use this machinery uh, in the ileum and is it specific? And the short answer is yes. We also have evidence that at least a subset of individuals with small bowel Crohn's disease probably have deficiencies in an MDR1 CAR and or many of the other genes that we've identified now uh, that protect T cells in the ileum from bile acid induced stress and inflammation. And so really what we're talking about going forward is we would like to envision you know, a scenario in which any newly diagnosed Crohn's disease patient uh, gets, gets examined for genetic mutations potentially in genes that are responsible for protecting T cells from bile acid induced stress and inflammation. Once those individuals are identified, then they could be put on these very safe and ineffect, uh, very safe, inexpensive, and highly effective bile acid sequestrants. Uh, and just to just to point out why we're so excited about this, right? So as I showed you, the current standard of care for for Crohn's disease, like many other inflammatory diseases, is to generally suppress the inflammatory response uh, through these antibodies that target inflammatory mediators. The problem with that is that is that that's, that's really blocking a consequence of inflammation, not a cause, right? That also acts systemically instead of locally. So it of course suppresses the entire immune system and most of these recently developed uh, biological agents cost thousands of dollars a dose. So by contrast, these bile acid sequestrants, we think, at least in some individuals, likely target an underlying cause of inflammation. They act locally 
uh, in the small intestine to prevent these pathogenic interactions between bile acids and your gut immune system. Uh, therefore, they don't suppress the entire immune system and potentially most, uh, most excitingly, they only cost about three bucks a pill. And so we're actually in the process right now of, uh, of trying to initiate a, a small investigational study in Crohn's disease to test the efficacy of these bile acid, of at least one of these uh, best in class bile acid sequestrants. And we're doing that together with the chief of gastroenterology at the University of Miami, uh, Maria Abreu. And so again, I hope just to bring this back, you know, I, what, what we're hoping is that uh, we may be fortunate enough that, uh, that the knowledge that we're, that we're generating, at least as it relates to inflammation and Crohn's disease, may be approaching one of these inflection points where we can really change the paradigm for how we think about and how we treat these, uh, this, this horrible disease. Uh, but then again, more broadly, I also wanna bring it back to say that of course there are hundreds of chronic inflammatory diseases and many of those are also tissue and organ specific, meaning that they only affect specific tissues. And so learning from our, uh, learning from our experience and our studies of Crohn's disease, we, you know, we, we, we look forward to asking if we can learn about the local interactions between T cells in different tissues of the body and very important uh, factors in those microenvironments, similar to the interaction between T cells and the ileum and bile acids, right? And potentially be able to target those interactions in a way uh, that uh, treats very effectively and very safely uh, tissue specific inflammatory diseases without suppressing the entire immune system. And so I think with that, I want to stop. I want to acknowledge the people that have really done the work and contributed to the work. Again, in my lab, uh, Wei Kao is a really talented former postdoc in the lab who led the work on the MDR1 transporter I told you about. Uh, a former graduate student in the lab, Meilan Chen, uh, uh, did the work on the CAR uh, transcription factor that I told you about that's coming out very soon. And then I also really want to acknowledge and call out really important collaborations, again, with our colleague here at Scripps Research, Matthew Pipkin, uh, Kiyoshi Takeda at Osaka University, uh, Sergei Korolov up at New York University. I mentioned uh, that we work very closely with the chief of GI at the University of, of Miami, Maria Abreu, uh, and also want to call out our, our great collaboration with Fabio Cominelli, who's an IBD, IBD physician at Case Western uh, up in Cleveland. We also have really important and, and very great collaborations with Casey Weaver at UAB and David Moore, who was at Baylor College of Medicine and is actually now out on the West Coast up in Berkeley. And uh, with that, I think I'll stop and take any questions. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, that, was, that was terrific, a uh, really great overview. There's a, there's a lot of questions queued up. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to aggregate some of them. Uh, here, let, let's, let's start with one of the themes maybe. Uh, is, is, you know, what, is, what can you say about the connection between inflammation and just aging, and in particular, you know the the you know the central nervous system and the manifestations of inflammation there. Yeah. So, um, you know, so the first thing that I would say is obviously the the understanding of of neuroimmunology, neuroinflammation, and its connection to some of these really horrible um, degenerative diseases. Right? Is is really still in its infancy. What we do know. Is that a lot of these diseases, right, are essentially build? Uh, they essentially derive from the misfolding of proteins and the aggregation of these proteins. So they sort of form these large bodies uh, in the nervous system, and and local macrophages, which are a type of immune cell that are really good at just sort of grabbing and eating stuff. Their 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 whole purpose of being is to is to eat bacteria, viruses, even dead or dying cells, and to sort of clean out tissues, if you like. And so they get activated, they can see these aggregates of proteins in the CNS that build up and they try to eat these things uh, and they become activated. And then that sets off this sort of inflammatory cascade that at least that's the, that's the overarching hypothesis right now. Right, terrific. You know, uh, there's another theme that's kind of, it's very much topical and on, on people's mind. And that has to do with you know, uh, COVID-19 inflammation and, and, yeah. and long haul syndrome. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'm sure that you're kind of following that and may, it's maybe not the IBD, but uh, may, uh, could you just expound on that for, for people a little bit? 
Yeah, so I think that there's really, there's really interesting evidence. You know, people have been doing some really high resolution analysis of immune cells that infiltrate the lung of patients, you know, of healthy individuals, of patients that get acute COVID but then recover, and those that get severe COVID and end up on the ventilator, right? And there's very clear evidence that the constellation of immune cells that end up setting that that end up setting up shop in the lung are completely different between productive inflammatory responses that clear COVID uh, and uh, and the type of inflammatory responses that lead to severe COVID. In particular, there's a lot of evidence. I think I mentioned this, and maybe I wasn't clear, but there's a lot of evidence that's accumulating that suggests that the, that the difference between type one and type three inflammatory responses are very important, where these type three inflammatory response tends to predominate in the patients that do poorly and end up in the hospital. Right. You know, uh, one, of our, one of our attendees is, um, is uh, Richard Yulevich. Mm -hmm. and, and he's, uh, so he actually, and it, it kind of goes with the theme that I was talking about. They, they did some interesting work uh, over 20 years ago on, uh, on CD, anti-CD14 antibodies. And it turns out they're now in clinical trials for treatment of uh, inflammation in COVID-19 patients. I heard oh. Richard's uh, stirring departmental faculty talk no more than a month or two ago. Yeah. Uh, and, and I thought it was a beautiful example, right, of how you can take a basic discovery that you don't even know what the application is gonna be yet, but then the right time comes along and it, and it works great. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, thanks. Um, here's an interesting question. So if you've had your gallbladder out, yeah. what happens uh, as, as the source of the bile acids? And then does it actually impact clinically your, the progression of any inflammatory bowel disease that you might have? Yeah, so I'm not aware of, you know, I'm sure that there's literature out that have looked at, you know, the, the relative risk of um, of say gallbladder removal as it relates to, to both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. What I'll tell you is biologically, right, is that essentially the gallbladder is the sac that stores bile acids that accumulate during periods of fasting, right? And so you get more regulated times of bile acid storage versus bile acid deposition that's sort of tightly regulated by your diet. So of course, if you get your gallbladder removed, you, all you do is you just lose that regulation, okay? But there are just unbelievably refined homeostatic mechanisms uh, that very tightly control the circulation of bile acids uh, and the relative um, biosynthesis of new bile acids. So the reason why you can, for example, sequester bile acids and prevent their reabsorption in the, in the small intestine, which then just uh, facilitates their excretion in feces uh, the reason why that works and why that's safe is because the liver senses that uh, and it just makes more bile acids. So it just compensates. And in fact, interestingly enough, I didn't mention this, but bile acid sequestrants right now are probably most widely used uh, as, uh, as adjuvant therapies for people with high cholesterol that don't do well on statins alone. So it's actually, these are cholesterol lowering agents. So, so Mark, you're clearly working toward a drug. Yeah. And, and, the, and, but you know, it's early days. So, but I think it's useful for the audience. If you would just outline, you know, the dream scenario, how, you know, how long, what would, what are the next steps to take your, you know, observations and discoveries and data and turn it into something that you can be pre prescribed. Just yeah. So here, here again, terms, yeah. yeah. So, so here again, I think that we are the beneficiaries of probably dumb luck in the sense that the mechanism that we've uncovered is already very effectively targeted by a generic FDA approved class of medicines, these bile acid sequestrants, right? Uh, so in fact, uh, off-label use of bile acid sequestrants in Crohn's disease, um, I wouldn't say that it's common, but it does happen, right? Uh, and, and incidentally, we have both myself and, and our collaborator at the University of Miami have heard a number of personal anecdotes where somebody writes us after they see our work and they say, you know, I got put on a bile acid sequestrant for a totally unrelated reason and my IBD got better, you know? Uh, so now 
what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a controlled clinical study uh, in order to actually demonstrate the efficacy so that we can take the next, next step to where this can be uh, prescribed as for, for on-label use, right? Uh, another theme, a couple people have asked about the, the interaction of the microbiome, so the diverse uh, bugs in your, yes. in your intestine and uh, both inflammation and then, and then uh, metabolism of bile acids in the gut. So maybe you could maybe you could talk about that a little. Bit. And yeah, so it's it, that's it's a great question, and again, that field is only now coming about. Uh, and I would, you know, I like to think that we've potentially had a small part in kickstarting this, right? Where before it was essentially looking at this binary interplay between bugs and your gut immune system, and now we sort of have this three dimensional interplay between bugs bile acids and the immune system. So bacteria absolutely uh, play important roles in shaping both the size and the composition of the bile acid pool. They metabolize bile acids, they change them chemically into new bile acid species that have different properties. And reciprocally, bile acids have potent uh, bacteriostatic effects. I mean, these things are detergents, so they kill many species of bile sensitive bacteria. Uh, and so not all bacteria uh, can, can coexist with, with bile. And it's really for that reason that there are much smaller amounts and numbers of bacteria in the small versus large intestine because there are such high concentrations of these uh, bacteriostatic bile acids. So there's all sorts of interesting uh, dynamics in, in the gut physiology that's going on. Um, another question that came up is, uh, you know, Obviously, this is all mediated by T cells. But if let's say you you're acute uh, treated for an, uh, a blood cancer and your your immune system is is wiped out, what happens to your you know inflammatory diseases? And then and when your uh, immune system rebuilds itself, uh, do you come back to a, a new set point, or, or you know, is there some benefit uh, in reducing inflammation? Yeah, I, I'm not I'm I'm not so sure that 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 there are that there are hard and fast rules about this. I mean, certainly uh, immune ablating therapies, for example, for cancer, uh, can even give rise to sort of acute bouts of colitis, right? Um, so this, this can happen. That probably has to do with which kind of immune cells get depleted and then which kind of immune cells come back up first. Uh, and it's potential, it's, you know, it's, it's thought, right, that there are both pro and anti, really specialized pro and anti-inflammatory immune cells. And so if you deplete all of them and the pro-inflammatory guys come back first, that's gonna favor inflammation. Right. Uh, okay, I think we've come up on our hour and uh, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of chatter going on here. We have over 150 questions and I'm just sorry, uh, but we have a transcript of all the questions and uh, someone can get, some of them are very straightforward to answer. Uh, this lecture will be available on YouTube. You can access it from uh, the front row uh, page and you can see all of the lectures. And in particular, if you wanna watch this again and see the slides, they will also be available. So Mark, thanks, uh, a terrifically engaging lecture. Uh, terrific results. We're really proud to have you here at Scripps. And uh, I wanna remind everyone to attend the, uh, the next front row, which will be Mikalina Janiszewska also from the Scripps Florida campus who will tell us about her basic inquiries into cancer. So again, I'm Jamie Williamson. It's been a pleasure to host all of you. We will get back to you with responses uh, by snail mail or email. And uh, thanks again for coming to the front row and be well.